third section here, um, I, we, we did, th this is a, a paper that we, we did back a year ago now, so that's why I was finding my piece of paper of, I wrote down some facts on because I, I do um, forget some stuff. But the key thing we looked at here is these stony soils and how significant are they? Um, our gut instinct and is, is that they're they quite significant, but we wanted to quantify that and have, having SMAP together with the AgriBase land use database, we were able to look at that and, and start to get some numbers around that. So we produced a paper at last year's Fertiliser and Lime Research Centre conference and that's available on the web if anyone's interested in doing that. So basically there's 1.68 million hectares of stony soils on, on land that's got potential for intensive land use in New Zealand. 900,000 hectares of that is in, within Canterbury and the number I was just looking up then was trying to look at but I think it's around 65% of the potential of the land with potential for intensification in Canterbury is, does have stony soils on it. So it's very significant for us down here. Um, in terms of land use pressure there is around 230,000 hectares of dairy uh, farming on, on these stony soils within New Zealand. It, Within Canterbury there's around 140,000 hectares which has roughly doubled over the last decade in terms of what we looked at there which equates to about 65% of the dairy land nowadays is on uh, the stony soils. That also links to irrig irrigation um, where we've been able to use remote sensing to map the actual um, ir irrigation across the Canterbury landscape. We picked up around 300,000 hectares, two thirds of that occurs on the stony soils. So. Don't worry about all the numbers, but the key, the key thing is these are very significant for us within Canterbury, but also in terms of New Zealand, and of particular significance for our irrigation developments, the big investments we're making in terms of irrigation. Broad groupings, if we want to chuck things together in, 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 into big groupings, is this is our classic stony soil where we've done a lot of research, the Lismore soil in New Zealand. That's where we've I shouldn't say a lot of research, the very little research that we have done on stony soils has been on these soils here. Uh, they have roughly around somewhere between about 20 to 40 centimetres of um, relatively stone-free stone material on top of a stony soil. There is big areas of a lot stonier soils um, th throughout New Zealand. In particular, the one we're going to talk about today is these, these kind of younger, stonier soils that don't have as much silt, silt within them uh, and, and a lot less clay, dominated by sand, dominated by stones. And so we'll talk about some of the experimental research on those soils. But there has been no, in terms of um, particularly uh, water use efficiency and um, contaminant movement, a big, big void. A little bit of research on this uh, over time. We are now all moving, and when I say all, all uh, ag research, land care, and um, plant and food, and land Lincoln, we, we, we are where we can within the constraints of our research funding to do a lot more focus on stony soils because of their significance. Traditionally they were dry land soils, so they weren't of a huge importance in that kind of side of things. The, the world has changed and water quality objectives will be determined by how we manage these soils. Why? Just recapping Linda's slide there, again, most of our lowlands, our, our, our flat intensive land is dominated by these soils and it, it is where most of our intensive development is, has been occurring. Traditionally, a lot of our work was you know, out where I live, Green Park area here, is on the, on the deep soils. Um, but there's only a limited number of those within the, within the Canterbury region. Uh, big areas in, in central Otago as well, northern Southland, uh, the Wairarapa, we've mapped big areas as well and, and, and stretching up into the Hawke's Bay. This is the map Linda showed before and what I've put on here is an additional map, nitrate leaching and phosphorus leaching. And what this shows is that if you look at the Lismore surface, the, the, one I sh the, the best soil we had, um, the stony soil we looked at before, Relatively high leaching vulnerability but for nitrate, but if you look at phosphorus, it drops down to low. This is the difference in the anion retention capacity of, of, of the soil, um, which is able to trap a lot more phosphorus. It's got a lot more clay and a lot more silt in there. Uh, nitrate, different attributes drive different, uh, the, the movement of, of different contaminants. The key thing is picking up these red zones. The red zones here, here out on the WiMAC kind of fan here, up, up above the airport down on the, on, on the Rakaia down here. These are the really young stony sands soils. Both maps, they come up as red, very high. We haven't had any real experimental evidence to test whether that model is a good prediction or, or not. So that what we're able to do is look at the stony soil research we've done, look at the land use pressures, and, and spatially target some, some research and go, yes, it's worthwhile us going to the, this end to see whether or not it's worthwhile us doing research on those. So again, the young stony soils. 
so I'll present some, uh, some uh, scoping study we did about that. That's presented in this year's Fertiliser and Lime Research Centre <coughs> conference, and the, that'll be up on the web in a couple of, couple of um, weeks. Key thing here is a scoping experiment. It, we, we really looked at was it worth us investing in doing much more research, you know, bigger scale research projects, because these things aren't cheap there. So what we really want to achieve in this scoping experiment is quantify this leaching vulnerability, this predicted leaching vulnerability, was it justified for these soils? And determine what's likely to be the key drivers of the leaching through, through those soils. So, and the purpose, again, I said, is a larger research program justified? Are we able to argue for, for that? Young stony soil that, that we've dug, collected out there. Scoping studies were based inside, so they're, they're preferential flow studies, they're not field-based projects, so there's caveats around, around all, all of this again, but again, it's a scoping study. Two sets of experiments we did. The first one is a classic preferential flow experiment, where we looked at under constant rate, a rate applied dairy shed effluent on the top of the lysimeters, 25 millimetres depth, irrigated um, at five millimetres an hour, then followed it up with five millimetres an hour simulated irrigation, constantly and then measured what came out the bottom in terms of uh, nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, trace elements, E. coli, um, hormones uh, uh, there. Second experiment we did, oh, and the E. coli results are published in, in, in this article here, just, just this year in Journal of Environmental Quality. So I won't go into those in a lot of detail actually, even though Raymond just asked me that I did, but I, I'll, I'll mention what I can again, remembering off we wrote what we wrote in that paper. Second set of experiments we did is we looked at periodic irrigation, so in this case what we did is we irrigated the lysimeters every three to four days on um, roughly putting on 15 to 20, 20 millimetres of irrigation, so there was kind of pulsed irrigation and that kind of side of things, more simulating the kind of the soil water dynamics that would occur under, you know, in, in real outside situations. We put on a series of sequential treatments and I'll show you the results in the first, but first treatment we applied superphosphate at a development stage so we, we cultivated the soil, re-sowed pasture, put on a, a big load of superphosphate, a few um, side treatments of, of, of urea, uh, irrigated until we had two 300 millimetres of drainage, um, and then applied urine. Again, let it irrigate, measure all the drainage in that for another 200, 300 millimetres, so quite a period of time. Applied dairy shed effluent. This time dairy shed effluent was applied in, in what we with um, ag research, what we developed is best management practices for irrigation of dairy shed effluent on different soils within New Zealand. This is one soil we hadn't been able to test it on, so we were able to test that best management practice. So rather than putting on 25 millimetres, we only put on half the amount, 10 millimetres, and at 10 millimetres an hour. See, did we get a big difference in behaviour between those two um, methods here? So we can look at that in a second. And we measured again nitrogen, phosphorus, in this case carbon, and um, trace elements, and in terms of dairy shed effluent, we also measured uh, E. coli. So if we look at the constant rate experiment, what we're looking at there is the cumulative um, leaching, and this is over the, um, the, the drainage, uh, over time. Classic preferential flow experiment would say that you won't get anything that you've applied on the top until you've displaced all the water that sits within that soil at that time. That's what we call matrix flow. So it kind of like acts like a piston and pushes out the water inside. In this case, it's roughly around 150 millimetres of water is what the soil can store maximum if all the pores will fill. Um, that's probably actually more likely to be on here because you simply can't fill these soils up with water because they can conduct it so fast. There's pores which will stay air filled. So what we're finding is that in the terms of phosphorus and cadmium here, both break through quite, quite, quite early on. So we're getting um, pretty strong preferential leaching under that scenario of uh, phosphorus and cadmium, both of which wouldn't have traditionally been seen as, as, as leachable kind of um, elements, but in this case they did. One, and that's the dotted, the open circles is the control. One lysimeter was much slower at leaching there, and I'll get into that explanation later as well, but it's really to do with the stone and sand ratios within the lysimeters. The sand lenses that you get in these young stony sands um, cause quite a different leaching behavior compared to the really stony segments, and that can vary within the space of a room here on that kind of side of things. So yes, under constant rate you can leach both phosphorus and cadmium. If we go to the, the periodic irrigation, which is um, you know, irrigating every three to four days, there what we, what we looked at is, again this is total phosphorus and cadmium down here, and we've got two lysimeters in this case, and the three treatments. So the first treatment, we first just leached to measure background, what was kind of coming out before we applied anything, was to apply our superphosphate, and we measured 
roughly, I don't know what that is, three, four hundred millimetres. I was writing the paper yesterday and I've forgotten it, but quite, you know, quite a lot of drainage to see what came out from that application. Then we, we applied a, a standard urine patch there, and again leak, um, irrigated and, and, and measured the leachate, and then we applied the DOC Deflon under best management practice. So under each one of these graphs that I show, it'll be the same treatments in that kind of order that we look at. Superphosphate didn't you know, cause a huge amount of leaching, urine was the big driver, and we'll see this repeated all the way through. In this case it mobilised quite a lot of P and cadmium through there, but interesting the DOC effluent didn't really make a big jump compared to what we saw under the constant rate. So the experimental method, the way by which we applied the, the DOC effluent made quite a difference in terms of leaching behaviour and the processes which are going on through there. If we look at um, nitrogen uh, that came out through there, and, and this one here again, superphosphate, urine, DOC effluent, the two lysimeters. Total amount of nitrogen um, quite similar between the, the two lysimeters in terms of what came out. Big driver again was the urine patch. Interesting that this jump we've got here is those 30 kilograms of um, uh, urea that was applied to, to, to get the pasture underway following there, but not so much a big jump in terms of dairy shed effluent. If you break it down in terms of uh, the, the nitrate, there's quite a difference in, in behaviour. The second lysimeter here leached out quite a lot more nitrate than, than the first lysimeter. Um, if you look at ammonium, it, you get the flip side. The first lysimeter had a lot of ammonium came out. So th th there you're looking, in that case, preferential flow of the urine from the surface effectively came out in, in the leachate very rapid straight after it was applied. You, you put, you're only putting on 10 millimetres, but it's being poured on at quite a, a high rate. Those soils have got a very high conductivity. They've got the ability to get rid of excess water very fast. So we provided the conditions, it, it went straight through in that situation. That explains the, the second lysimeter, that's just where the sand then's coming in. This is from our, we dug out all the lysimeters afterwards and, and studied what, was, what made it in. The big difference was there was a sand lens in one lysimeter compared to the other lysimeter. The one with the sand lens, a lot less ammonium, a lot less direct transfer, but a greater amount of nitrate came out. Still ended up with roughly the same amount, but different transfer processes happening within the soil. So the key findings is um, this scoping study does indicate that our assessment of high vulnerability for these seals, for these young stony soils is um, justified through there, but th th they'll behave quite differently in terms of the processes that go through. Urine is, is a key driver of the leaching and not just for nitrogen, and we saw there it, it was, um, it drove both the, the leaching of um, cadmium and phosphorus as well. Uh, so, and under different conditions, contaminants can show different behaviours, and I didn't really get into it, but the phosphorus and the cadmium showed quite different behaviours under the constant rate compared to the periodic rate, so I didn't get into that too much, but it's not, it's not necessarily a simple process. But in terms of the dairy shed effluent, that, that good management practice actually looked reasonably promising from that, um, from that scoping study there. Uh, by, by just dropping the rate down and dropping the depth down and not constantly irrigating it, so avoiding heavy rainfall, yeah, yeah, there wasn't a huge amount of direct leaching that came from, from the dairy shed effluent there. So that, what would our recommendations, recommendations be? Given the intensification of these vulnerable soils, further research is urgently required, but we, we felt that's quite justified from this series of scoping studies, that it would be worthwhile doing some, um, some uh, field experiments understanding these soils, we, un we can learn a lot out of them and we can then the better soils should be a lot, lot better to manage. And we need to expand, expand, expand our range of soil types beyond our, beyond our traditional good friends. We need to be, move beyond the, the Templeton and, and the Lismore and, and, and we're all getting into agreement with that. Um, we've got classic soils, we're quite comfortable with them, we've done a lot of research over time, but as we said there's 4,000 different kind of siblings within New Zealand, there's a, a big range of soils and we need to be able to study. And, but again, as I've shown here, be able to spatially target where we do research, not Sam's little favourite that he wants to do because it's of great interest and things like that, it should be justified, we should be able to say we want to research this because it's this many hectares associated with this land use and this sensitive environment and things like that, so we know what return we're getting for that. That's quite easy to be able to do that based on using the spatial information.